everyone. I am super excited to be introducing Dr. Don Musalem, a consultant in the Department of Hematology Oncology at Mayo Clinic and an assistant professor of medicine. She is a diagnostic breast specialist at the Jacoby Center for Breast Health, Health and serves as medical director for Mayo Clinic Florida's Center for Humanities in Medicine. She is double board certified, including a board certification in lifestyle medicine. Additionally, she has national recognition in the field of breast medicine, lifestyle medicine, <clears throat> excuse me, integrative oncology, and cancer survivorship. She has a unique personal experience as a stage four cancer patient diagnosed just three months into medical school and in 2021, a heart transplant recipient. She shares that her journey as a patient cultivated her boundless energy and deep purpose to help patients flourish during and after adversity. In 2015, she founded the Integrative Medicine and Breast Health Program at Mayo Clinic Florida. This patient-centered program works with breast cancer patients during and after breast cancer diagnosis, introducing them to the importance of lifestyle optimization alongside conventional cancer treatments. Her research focuses on the impact of whole food, plant-based nutrition and weight management on breast cancer outcomes and quality of life. As a treatment or as a testament to her success, Dr. Musalem has received many awards and honors, including being named the 2021 Marquis Who's Who in America's Top Doctor for her leadership, dedication, and achievements in integrative oncology. In 2020, she was in the Marquis Who Who's Who's Who in America, Mayo Clinic's Patient Experience Award, and Mayo Clinic's Florida Hospital Instructor of the Year. These are just to name a few. I would be here most of the hour going through all of her awards and accolades. She is a physician, a mother, a wife, a daughter, and on February 6, 2022, she became the very first person in the world to run a full marathon just one year after a heart transplant and is now working on completing the Abbott majors. And I promise you, I have a question about the Abbott majors and maybe some stability upstairs. Anyway, it is my pleasure once again to welcome Dr. Dawn Musalem. Gosh, thank you so much, Debbie. And honestly, I'm just a girl that loves life. That is what this is all about. And those very nice things that you said, it's, it's really all about my patients. And my life journey is about something so much bigger than me. And it's such an honor. Thank you both Pope Wellness and for, I love the name of the podcast, by the way, Chat and Chew More Plants. I think that is awesome, awesome, awesome. And it is such a privilege to be here to share my personal journey. And, you know, we should never compare our own journey to someone else's. But I feel that I've been able to really leverage some of the pillars, all of the pillars really of lifestyle medicine to help me attain vitality due, uh, during many of the adversities I had, I had uh, been exposed to, as well as to flourish thereafter. So that's what we're going to talk about. And, you know, I titled my talk Timelessness, and you'll understand a little bit more of that as we go along. And so I want you all just to pause for a moment. A lot of you may have been rushing through your morning, and now it's lunchtime, so let's just pause. I want you to take a moment to picture the ideal day of your life. What would that look like? You know, you can also maybe picture who would you want to spend that perfect day with. Now, the next question I'm going to ask you is one that's a little more provocative, actually a lot provocative and quite uncomfortable for many people. So the next question is, 
what if this was your last living breath? You know, we infrequently think about death. We actually many times run from the thought of death. But what is so interesting in the Himalayan province of Bhutan, they actually meditate on this concept of death five times a day. And it's the happiest place on earth. You know, it's a puzzling paradox in human life, and we know that our time is limited, yet we live like it's not. You know, we're in this hurry. We don't really pay attention to the precious present moments that are right in front of us. And I love Stoic philosophy. If any of you follow uh, different folks on Instagram, there's some great Instagram um, individuals that you can follow that really post a lot of great quotes from Stoic philosophers that send really positive messages. And I happen to love Seneca, and I love this, so I want to share this with you. A whole lifetime is needed to learn how to live, and perhaps you'll find this more surprising. A whole lifetime is needed to learn how to die. And so I think that just allows us to have some reflection. And so I'm going to use that as a stepping stone to share one day that I will never forget. And so this was September 22nd, 2016. And I absolutely love my time with patients. And it's pretty much every time I'm with patients that I'm always running over because I just get tickled to spend every single moment with them that I can. Then at the end, there's always one additional story that we want to talk about. So on this particular day, though, I had to be punctual. I had to get done by noon because I was scheduled to present to a group of Mayo Clinic leaders about the success of the integrative breast oncology program I had piloted in the breast clinic. So I was in a hurry. I rushed to the stairwell. And at the top of the stairwell, I remember standing there. And my knees were kind of quivering. They felt weak. And I thought, oh my gosh, why do I feel like this? You know, you question yourself, is it nerves? I'm not nervous. I love talking to people. <laughs> Definitely not nerves. So I thought, did I eat breakfast? Ate breakfast. Did I sleep OK? Slept OK? Did I have too much caffeine? No. So I continued going through all these little scenarios in my brain as I'm walking down the stairs, my legs just felt more and more weak to where I really had to plant my feet on those steps so I didn't collapse. I got to the bottom of the steps and I still felt really weird, but I knew the time was ticking and I had to rush to that boardroom. So I rushed to the boardroom. There's this big, heavy wooden door. I remember it was so hard to open that door. I opened the door and there's a bunch of Mayo Clinic leaders sitting there with most of them quite serious faces. And on most days, I would kind of crack a light joke to break the tension in the room like we, like we all do when we get even a little bit nervous maybe, right? But not on this day. I knew that I needed to just stay focused because my energy just felt totally off. So they had my seat at the front of the table. And for those of you that have worked on a computer or done any presentations, of course, they would have it to where the screen was at the opposite end of the room. And so I had to take the mouse in my hand and try to coordinate the cursor on the screen that's like a football field feeling away from where I was sitting. And so I remember it was so difficult to coordinate that cursor with the screen and what I was trying to present. And I noticed as seconds went by, the cursor got lighter and lighter to the point I no longer saw that cursor. And this here was my last conscious memory. And so I know you're all at home or maybe at the office, but I want you to experience with me what happened next. And so go ahead and just close your eyes. You know, you've probably been in a, in a rush all morning. So let's just close our eyes and I just want you to relax and experience this place of what is vast darkness. And I want you to take notice of the still silence that surrounds you. When I was in this place. It was a place of innocence, of comfort. There was an essence of timelessness. There was no fear and only acceptance of the complete unknowing. I want you to embrace the feeling of cool air with a slight breeze. And I remember in this experience, a wisp of hair had hit my cheek and following that a wisp of hair had hit my lip and one single hair actually got stuck on my lip as if it was a reminder that I was still present. I felt as if my entire body was enveloped in love and as if the hands of God's were, God was holding me in this moment. Now I want 
you to turn your attention to your breath right now. And go ahead and place your hand on your heart and feel the harmony of its rhythmic beat. And let's send a loving message to your soul. And when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. And we're going to revisit this experience, but I want to first go to a little bit of my backstory so you can understand a little bit about how my life journey began. And as a young girl, I don't know if any of you remember this, but my childhood dream was to live to be 100 and to be a doctor. And so I was just thrilled when it came to anything that had to do with vitality, health, and longevity. And this really ignited my curiosity early on. And that's really what contributed to this childhood dream of wanting to be 100. And I love the Today Show with Willard Scott's Smucker's 100th birthday celebration. So the funny thing was, is when people would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oftentimes I would say, I want to be in a Smucker's jar. And they had no idea what I was talking about. But that's what I was talking about. I had what I thought was really the perfect life all through my childhood, high school, up until college. And I was one of the very fortunate individuals that in the fall of 2000, I was accepted and I started medical school. But a few months into medical school, I wasn't feeling good. And that was really unusual for me because as a young girl, I was always healthy. I lived a very healthy lifestyle. So I was just used to just living this really, like I said, perfect life. But now I had this cough and I was a little bit wheezy and I just felt unusual. So I went to see the doctor. The doctor said, oh, you probably have adult onset asthma. Just use this inhaler. So that's what I did. I continued on with my regular workouts, trying to run. I loved climbing Camelback Mountain. My medical school was in Arizona. And soon I found out that, gosh, these activities that used to be so easy for me were getting harder and harder. So I went back to that doctor after a few weeks. And he said, well, you just need to use it more often. I said, OK. So I started using it more often. But unfortunately, my symptoms did not get any better. So a few more weeks go by, symptoms are getting worse. And I'm really to the point now that I can't even walk 10, 20 feet without having this dramatic shortness of breath, a big shift from my usual healthy state. So I went and saw a third doctor. And he said, you know, I really think this is in your head. This happens to medical students, and it's called psychosomatic. Psycho meaning head, somatic meaning manifestation that's happening in your body. So I left the office thinking, gosh, you know, is this really in your head, knowing that it just didn't seem right? And a few days later, I collapsed on my way up the stairs to my apartment. I was taken to the emergency room, and this was just a few days from today, 22 years, November 23rd, 2000. It was Thanksgiving Day. They did a CAT scan, and I had a massive tumor in my chest. The tumor was over 16 centimeters, and it was wrapped around my heart and through the great vessels and collapsing a lung. And you can see in that picture there where the left lung is completely collapsed. And in doing that, it pushed everything over to the right side of my body. And I was in cardiogenic shock because my heart could not function properly. The CAT scan showed this tumor. They took me to urgent surgery. And in the surgery, they weren't able to remove the tumor because it was so large, but they were able to do biopsy samples. And the next day, the doctor came in my room and he diagnosed me with stage four diffuse B cell lymphoma. And I was 26 years old at the time. And he said, you need to start chemotherapy immediately. You're going to be very sick, so you're going to have to quit medical school. You're not going to be able to have children. There's no time for fertility preservation. And you know, thinking back, maybe that was the best thing that I had this really harsh doctor that kind of completely like kerplunked the idea of hope, right? Because it, what I would say is it kind of triggered this immense autonomous motivation to steer my own ship. I was in control and, oh gosh, he doesn't know who he's talking to. And man, cancer, you don't know who you're messing with. I am going to be on that smucker's jar. So it was kind of like game on. But in all seriousness, I was really terrified inside. Like what was going on? But it was just me. You know, I wasn't married. I didn't have a child. And my only concern was me. I just needed to take care of myself. So my actual oncologist turned out to be a very positive, hopeful man, filled with positive energy. And he told me that I am willing to fight every step of the way if you are. And that's exactly what we did. 
So my treatment included several months of what's called CHOP chemotherapy, which is a very intensive chemotherapy regimen. And during this chemotherapy, I remained very active with running and hiking. And in fact, it was awesome because as soon as you get that chemo, that tumor starts shrinking. And in fact, they gave me, they had me stay in the hospital for that first uh, chemotherapy because they're so worried that all that tumor burden is going to melt away and it can cause kidney failure and other damage to the organs. But the awesome thing was is that tumor went away, I started feeling better, and I was able to resume my activity, continued eating my very healthy diet during this entire time. And one really important message I'd like to send to my patients today is a big aspect of I feel why I did so well during my treatment, emotionally and physically, is because I accepted my diagnosis. I ended up hiring doctors that I trusted so they could do their job while I did my job of taking good care of myself. I remember taking a copy of Bernie Siegel's book, Peace, Love, and Healing, with me everywhere I went. I would always have it with me at chemotherapy, and anytime I could read parts of that book just for positive uh, motivation, I would read that book. It was something that really served to be a guide for me during this time. And because I had that stage four cancer, they had to do a bone marrow transplant. And during that bone marrow transplant, you, that was back in the day, in 2000, and you know, you're basically the girl in the bubble back then. And so I remember looking out to the other people. It was like a circular hospital room. And I remember looking out to other people in the hospital, and they all looked sick. But I wasn't sick. During this time, I really attained my vitality without a pause. And in fact, while getting chemo, I felt more energized, and I had complete clarity of thought, and my senses were heightened. And I think you guys saw this picture, but this is how I think normal existence is, but this is how mine was. It was vibrant. It was awesome. And so following the bone marrow transplant, I did, have to, I did have to do several months of radiation, but ultimately I was cured. The stage four cancer was gone. And so we just have to believe in miracles. Be an outlier and not a number. It was about a year later that my husband Charles and I found out another miracle the one of growing our family. I was pregnant and my daughter Sophia was born in 2003. It was a few weeks after giving birth to Sophia that I again started not feeling well. And in fact, it was very similar to what it was that day that I went up those stairs and collapsed. But this time I remembered how those symptoms felt. So I knew I had to go to the ER before I collapsed. I got to the ER and interestingly enough, the chest x-ray looked almost exactly as it did when I was diagnosed with cancer. But this time the diagnosis was different. I found out that I was in cardiogenic shock again, but this time it was because my heart wasn't pumping effectively and it was only pumping at 8%. Fortunately, this was in 2003, my doctors were able to stabilize my condition with medical management, meaning medicines. I didn't need a transplant at that time. Did lots of cardiac rehab, which I was so tickled to be able to do. And I got well enough so that in 2004, I was, be, I was able to return to my medical training at Mayo Clinic. And both my medical training at Mayo Clinic as well as my medical team at Mayo Clinic that was taking care of my heart failure just filled me with hope. But then in 2007, things took a little bit of a turn. My symptoms started coming back. The residency was really hard on me because of the call schedules. And so I had to take a little bit of time off and they put a device in my chest. It was an investigational device to see if it could help that heart beat a little bit better. And while I was off during that time, trying to recover, trying to get stronger, trying to see if that device would eventually work, it was about a year later. So we fast forward to August 24th, 2008. And I, this was the most profound moment in memory, I think, of my life. And I remember in this particular moment, um, my daughter was playing, and it was early in the morning, and my husband wasn't up. And so it was about 9 o'clock, and he, him and I both wake up at 4 a.m. We're early, early morning people, so I knew something was wrong. And so I went into the bedroom, and I found his lifeless body. And... That heightened existence that I had always had, it basically just free fell within an instant. And I remained there for about nine months. There was no highs. There was no lows that dipped below that flat level of existence, but I was just so down. And grief is really an individual experience. And, and we can't compare how someone handles their grief compared to another. 
It was during this time that I just searched for such deep meaning in life. And after Charles's death, I would say it was really my faith in God that brought me through. And so if we're awake to the transformative power of anything that's hard in life, whether that's loss, any sort of suffering, grief, pain, trauma, addiction, one can move beyond just merely coping with that hardship and instead transcend into a life of renewal. And I really believe that an awakened life is an inspired life. I think, there we go, let me try to, there we go. And so it was during this time that I really, really learned to show up for myself. But to never lose sight that in life, we have to give a tremendous amount of self to the needs and serve others as well. But we can look at the heart. And I just love this. One of my mentors shared this with me many years ago. And what he shared with me is, Dawn, the heart keeps 5% of the blood it pumps for itself. It cares for itself before it can serve the rest of the body. And so the message here is that each one of you, you must nurture yourself. We must eat healthy. We must move our body. We must get adequate sleep. We should avoid toxic substances. Stress is inevitable. You can't get rid of stress. It's part of the human experience, but we should try to manage it to the best of our abilities. And last, but certainly probably most important, is deep social connections and love for one another. So I want to go back to that day we started with, September 22nd, 2016. This near-death experience ignited a full awakening to the embrace of a spiritual union with God that for me connected my non-beating heart really direct to this hopeful soul. And what was so amazing is in this moment, I was really more alive during this time of what we clinically define as death than most people probably experience in a lifetime. And shock after shock, I was not returning to life. But then there was this giant tsunami of energy that came through my body. And then the force of my defibrillator, so part of that device that they put in my chest in 2007, part of that device included a defibrillator. It shocked my physical body back to life. And I'll never forget this moment as well. My entire body was bursting with this electrifying energy. And it was truly like a mystic, miraculous, difficult to really verbalize the experience of this immense power. Following that episode, the next few years, however, were very physically challenging. I continued to work, but it became exceedingly difficult to talk without even passing out. I would be examining patients and my fingers would be blue, or I would be examining patients and I'd have to lean into the table because my legs were so weak. I felt like I would collapse, but I pushed through because that time with my patients is what brought me so much joy. Ultimately, I was listed for heart transplant in December of 2019. But during this time, I couldn't drive anymore, so it made more sense for me to start working from home. So that's exactly what I did. And in fact, because I knew I would end up with some idle time, that's when I set out to become board certified in lifestyle medicine. And it's so funny, as I was preparing some of these slides, I was like, I'm going to see if I still have that board certification. Congratulations, Dawn. So when I got this, I'm like, little do they know that that is hard for me to think and take that test. But I was so excited to become board certified in lifestyle medicine, though, I had known a lot about this because this had been my lifelong passion. Getting my board certifi certification through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, I feel really saved my life for one reason. I'll share that with you in a minute. But it's really helped me to be a better doctor as well. It taught me exactly what I needed to do with whole food plant-based nutrition and how to optimize it individually for many of the patients I see. You really still have to take it case by case when we meet with patients, when we're talking about plant-based nutrition. And maybe it doesn't have to be plant-only nutrition, but maybe it needs to be plant-predominant nutrition. But the reason I think that my board certification may have saved my life is during that time that I was listed for heart transplant, in November of 2020, I think it was a day or two after I got this letter, I was diagnosed with COVID. And so now I have COVID, I have advanced heart failure, my heart's hardly working, and I'm waiting for a heart transplant. This was terrible. I mean, I think my family thought for sure I was going to die. And because I had COVID, I wasn't eligible for a heart for a period of time. 
I beat COVID. That was awesome. And I think the plant-based diet really helped to contribute to that. But I did continue to decline. And ultimately, in January of 2021, I had become so sick that it was no longer stable for me to be outside of the hospital. So I was admitted to the hospital for supportive therapy in January of 2021. On February 5th, 2021, while I was in the hospital, Dr. Patel, really, truly one of the world's most kind, warm, loving, compassionate doctors was waiting for me in the hall. My daughter had come to visit me that night after school to have dinner with me. And I walked her to the elevator. I saw him waiting there. And I thought, oh, someone got their heart. That is so wonderful. And he said, do you have a minute, Dawn? I have something to tell you. I want to talk to you. I was like, oh, no. It was the most awkward walk ever. It was like walking down a hall, and you don't know really if you should put your hands in front of your body, at the side of your body, cross your arm. You know how that is. I just didn't, you didn't know if you should talk or just be quiet. So we were both quiet. I think we were both nervous about what he was about to tell me. So we got into my room, and then he gave me the news. He's like, Dawn, there was a matching heart. And I was waiting for these words for so many years, far earlier than when I was listed for transplant, because honestly, when I was diagnosed with heart failure, when my daughter was born 18 years earlier, we knew heart transplant would ultimately be what I would need to really help my symptoms. And here it was. They finally, after all, after all this time, have heart for me. You would think I would be the most exciting news in the world. But here I was faced with this reality suddenly that every memory my heart held would be removed. And that someone else has to die in order to give me life. You know, I think another family's grieving while mine's rejoicing. These emotions just were just such a whirlwind in my mind. And then Dr. Patel had something else to tell me. He shared with me that the matching heart was actually from an IV drug user who had hepatitis C. And I thought, oh gosh, what a, how is this possible? Like here I've taken such good care of my body my whole life, and now I'm gonna get a heart from someone who's an IV drug user. And before I had my transplant, I had a good friend of mine who's a psychiatrist come to visit me once. And his friend said, well, Dawn, are you sure you want a heart transplant? I was like, oh, I don't really want one, but I need one. And he's like, but aren't you scared your personality is going to change? You know, I learned so much from that conversation with that friend because our words are so powerful. Because honestly, it was the words of that friend of mine that really stood in the way of me being accepting of this heart. And so I told Dr. Patel I need to think about it. And I did, so I reflected over this for a few hours, and then all of a sudden, I just had this deep knowing that this heart was right for me, and I was ready. So I remember them taking me down to the operating room, and you know, all of you, most of us, have probably had surgeries before. And before any surgery I had had before, I remember always being a little bit worried. I would always pray. You know, they're putting you under anesthesia, and you pray, like, please God, let me wake up after the surgery. So I remember getting in the operating room and getting eye contact with my surgeon. And it was in that moment that I had no fear. I remember laying there as they started the anesthesia. And the only thing I remember was being in a complete state of peace. And instead of praying for me to wake up, I remember praying for my donor and for her family, just so grateful for the life that they were ready to give me knowing that in a few days I would wake up to the beating of my new heart. And a few days later, I was extubated, and that's exactly what happened. I was awestruck by the harmony of the whistling sound of my hair that brushed rhythmically against the crisp white sheets on that pillow. And it was in sync with the powerful beat of my new heart. It was the coolest thing. Like I had goosebumps from head to toe when I tell this story. I wish each of you could fear, feel like the power of life when it comes back into you. And my body was warm for the first time in 18 years. I forgot what that felt like. And my mind was crystal clear. It's like I could appreciate everything that was going on within me and around me. And the most amazing thing was that it was as if every single cell in my body was vibrating at this higher frequency. It was really, truly a glorious experience. A few nights later, though, I was extremely restless. And it's like I had forgotten this amazing feeling of having my new heart. And I was mad, totally mad, mean, ugly, mad, like not nice kind of 
brain thoughts there. They give me really high dose steroids, like super high dose. So I thought, oh, it's probably the steroids. This is not a good thing. So I remember falling asleep that night and I had a dream. I had this powerful, powerful dream. And honestly, I don't know if it was really a dream or more of like a sensory experience, but in this dream, I woke up and I was in this dwelling place that was this concrete building. And in this dwelling place, there was a window. So I ran to the window to see if my car was there. There was no car. There was a chair in this dwelling place. And I remember going over to the chair to see what the significance of the chair was. My purse wasn't there. What did this chair mean? And to the right of the chair, there was a door that was open, no door even on it. And outside that door, there was tall blades of grass that were blowing in the wind. And I crawled to the door. I crawled through the grass. And I'm sure you've all remember when grass hits your leg. It almost feels like I cut it at times. It kind of sticks to your leg, those long blades of grass. The blades of grass were grabbing my leg as I crawled through the grass. And I eventually flipped over. And I remember looking up in the dream and seeing these cumulus clouds overhead just moving above my head as the wind blew. And then deep in the distance, there were these, there were these people, these families with children. And they were playing. And it was just true, harmonious existence filled with love. And this word came over me, and it was grace. And so I woke up, and when I was in the hospital, every single night I would listen to instrumental music, and I happened to look at my phone, curious what time it was. The song that was playing instrumentally on my phone, the title of the song was Grace. And so during that moment, I thought, you know, I, I can't fall back asleep right now. I'll check my emails. So I check my email and I open up my computer, go to my email. And one of the emails waiting for me was titled full of grace. So we have to pay attention to messages in life and grace is a virtue from God. And it's the power that God willingly gives us to help us do what we could do. Perhaps something we never could have done on our own. And I really believe that our existence on this planet is already justified. We just have to look for the messages that guide us. And so the meaning of our life is really to find your gift. And the purpose of our life, though, is to share it with others. And that's why it's really such a privilege and pleasure. And initially, when I was asked to share my story um, by folks over the past year, I, I kind of would be shy and think, oh, I don't like to talk about myself. But I'm really just sharing my joy and love for life with you. And receiving the gift of life, a heart from a stranger, has really drawn me towards this longing to establish these loving connections with people like each of you. And so just know right now I'm sending my love to each of you. I think we don't have enough of that in the world. You know, purpose really infuses life with boundless inspiration, direction, meaning, and creativity. I don't usually get emotional. It must be that we have such a sweet audience. But, you know, you just want to do what's gloriously possible. And maybe it was even impossible because it'll be waiting for you. And you know, there was waiting for me. It was the second wind in this journey of life. And so it really was about the knowing you have what it takes to cultivate this fire, this passion in your belly desire to push to extremes and to really do all that you're meant to do. You know, for me, after the transplants, like, everything was effortless. And it was one opportunity after another, and they still just keep on coming. And even the struggles didn't result and don't result in dead ends. It's just the possibilities continue even when the limit looks like it may be set. And it was funny, when I was listed for transplant, I shared with my friends and colleagues that I would run a marathon one year from transplant, and they all were like, oh, you mean a half? I'm like, no, I think a full. So this is funny, though. After my transplant, you know, I'm kind of fast forward past that part. Holy cow, that first step was so hard. I, I couldn't even walk. I couldn't even take a step. I had a full walker with two people holding my arms. And one step was the hardest challenge I had ever done. So all of a sudden I thought, uh-oh, maybe I shouldn't have said one year from transplant. Maybe they knew more than me. But I wanted to try. And the reason I wanted to try so hard to run that marathon one year from transplant wasn't really because no one else had ever done it. Well, maybe because no man had ever done it. I'm like, yeah, we need a girl to beat the boys. So that was part of the driving motivation. But more importantly, so I could apply those pillars of lifestyle medicine. Because, you know, when it comes to grittiness and being tough, I think every single patient going through transplant that I've met has all the same qualities I do. When you're given that second chance at life, you have 
met your mortality head on. You know when you're getting that heart, you may or may not live through this. You're praying that you are and you're going to have this glorious life after, just like I have. But you don't know. There's significant unknowing. But the only thing that I feel is really different, what I did, is my whole food plant-based diet. And so guess what? One year after transplant, I ran the full marathon. And I want you to look at this sign. This was at the finish line. I cannot make this up. But where that red arrow is, the construction company's name was Grace. It was so cool. And the other cool thing is my number, and it wasn't planned, was 365, which was 365 days from transplant. So again, being that first person to run that marathon, it was really more metaphorical. It was a real representation of life. And since that time, since my transplant, I've just ascended this escalator of human experience. And I really am just at this glorious tip-top level. And I feel like my life is just saturated with this loving harmony. And I, I just get to experience these aha moments one after another like this, being with you today. And it's really these experiences that sustain this heightened level of existence that energizes me. Here's, I had to share a picture of my colleagues because they were so supportive during this entire journey. And I think having all the love that surrounded me is really what supported me going through this. But I've had people say, how did you really do it? Like the word grittiness, you know, I, lo I actually love that word. I had someone recently on an Instagram post say they didn't like that word. I was like, oh, I love that word. I, I think it, it's a cool word. So I liked being gritty personally, and I really wanted to be hardwired to flourish. And I feel there were a few things that it took to get me through. And we all have adversity, so maybe some of these little things help you. And so I found that never letting go of my goal-directed mission of wanting to deliver that original medicine. And when I say original medicine, I mean that medicine that is delivered through that lens of love for humanity. And at a basic biological level, we want to be connected, care, and love for others. So how blessed am I, am I to be a doctor? I get to do that every single day. So my work is really my joy, and it's truly my purpose. I controlled my thoughts, and I, I really flipped that script of both cancer and chemo, as well as heart transplant, and I forced my brain to reframe both of these as a teacher of life. And I really think this helped me to attain a life filled with blissful existence during those times of adversity. And I accepted what I could control. Acceptance is key. If you fight it, you're going to be miserable. Because in life, if it's coming our way, fighting it's not going to help. It's already there. We have to accept it and work through it. And then lastly, I was and am just filled with immense gratitude to be able really, in retrospect, to remain pretty well during this time. And I attribute that being pretty well during these years of being very sick because I lived a healthy lifestyle. But I also attribute this fact that I was well and give so much gratitude to my loving family and friends. And truly, most importantly, my strong belief in God. And it's this gratitude that increases optimism. And it moves us from a place of nothing to a place of abundance, right? Because if you're grateful for something, it means you have something. And that matters. And so we really want to harness that adversity and we want to use that post-traumatic growth as a springboard to guide us to discover these new strengths and possibilities and help it guide us to focus on your purpose. Because this purpose, it can really act as a rallying cry and it can bring others to your cause. And for those folks that have some anxiety or nervousness, it can help to guard against that. You know, time is given for a purpose. It's not intended to be idle. So we really shouldn't fear work without an end. And when it comes to goals, you know, and I think this is important because we're here really to talk a little bit about my story and also answer any questions you have about living a healthy life. But I think when it comes to living a healthy life, we should set forth big goals. We should set forth big goals in everything we do in life. And, you know, beyond that, when it comes to purpose, having goals that help us uphold this transformative guide and maybe one that's kind of embedded in a spiritual connectedness. And, and again, that deep love for other people. And for me, my purpose is really my family and my work, like I shared with you. And so here is a picture of my daughter and I. This was uh, the first vacation that I was able to go on after my heart transplant, which was so meaningful because for my entire life and my daughter's life, 
we were able to go on many family vacations that were very lovely and memorable, but I wasn't able to do much. I was very limited. So this one, we got to chase waterfalls, and it was amazing. And now that I'm able to do a lot of things, it's so awesome because I, we have groups. And in fact, I see that Lisa, I, I know that one of the folks on here, Lisa, is in this group. And so it's so super cool. And so is Sandy. So I see a few people in this group um, who are friends and patients and colleagues. And we all got a big group together and we did the Mother's Day 5K together. So it's just been a lot of fun to do these different organized events. But I think in life, we want to try to really cultivate awe-inspiring experiences. These experience release those neurotransmitters that help us interact ways of change. And we want to orient ourselves around something bigger than us. And this is going to serve as that firewall that will move life towards love. A lot of people may say, but I just don't have the time for this. But we got to harness that deep time because it's that perspective on, of time that will shift and will help you attain those goals that you set out to do. And when we harness this deep time, it can help you to navigate through these certain illusions of clock time. And you'll notice that things slow down. Time can sometimes stand still. And as we started off in the very beginning, when we went through kind of that guided meditation, when I had that near-death experience, that timelessness, this is also kind of called a state of flow when everything stands still. A really nice book, you know, I think time is probably one of the biggest things I hear from my patients standing in the way of them being able to meet their goals when it comes to primarily exercise. But I really love this book by Oliver Berkman. It's, the title of the book is 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. And he writes in this book about becoming a better procrastinator. And I think that's so cool. And you know, we're finite. We're finite people. We're going to die. We have that in common. Every single person walking the face of this earth has that in common. But the number of things that are important to us are infinite. And that doesn't work together. So we can only get done what matters. And so we have to learn to know what to neglect. And that can be a hard one. But you want to put the things that are most precious to you at the front. And so here are the pillars of lifestyle medicine. You know, again, I, I would say the majority of the patients that come to see me for lifestyle medicine, probably 90% of what they want to talk about is the nutrition. But the other pillars of lifestyle medicine I kind of talked about at the very beginning, we have nutrition, we have movement, we have managing the stress we all experience, it. we have avoiding toxic substances, sleep, and then of course my favorite, social connections. So I just want to tap on just a few little things with nutrition because I love the nutrition part of this. And I think it's a no-brainer that everything to the left of this screen, healthy food is good for us. Everything to the right of the screen is terrible for us. And everything in the middle is kind of debatable. So it looks kind of like this, right? I should have put a huge heart, but then I would have covered everything up. So the stuff in the middle, you know, chicken, eggs, dairy, fish, that stuff, it's kind of hard to know what direction, if it's healthy or unhealthy, it's kind of in the middle. And I think it's just fine if people don't want to be on a whole food plant only diet to have these things in the small servings. But some people may want to be a little bit more like this. And this is the kind of nutrition that I uphold is truly a whole food plant only diet that doesn't have any oil and no added sugar to my food. And this is the diet that I feel makes me feel awesome. So I love it. Uh, so my patients that are willing to do this with their diet, I am tickled to work with them. But I also have other people that if they did this diet, this would cause so much turbulence and disharmony in their body. Maybe we just fix their breakfast. Or maybe they want to do breakfast and lunch, which is my favorite, if we can at least get them to that part. And then dinner, a lot of times what we'll do is if they're going to have poultry or fish, or even if they're going to have a little piece of beef, maybe we just do two to three ounces rather than that four to six ounces or bigger. We bring those serving sizes down. This is kind of my little guide, you know, in order to strive for the best nutrition, this is really what I go after right here. And the cool thing with whole food plant-based nutrition is you feel better after three days of being on this diet. So it's a pretty easy sell. As soon as my patients switch over and they start feeling better, they're like, oh, I'm not going to stop doing this at this point. Your skin looks better after about two weeks. And after three weeks, you reduce your mortality by 10%. And I don't know, there's not a lady out there. I don't know, there could be men on the 
call, but usually it's women that sign in for these. So ladies, if you're trying to watch your girlish figure, you can lose five to eight pounds in four weeks on this diet. And I've had tremendous success with weight loss among my patients, which has been very exciting as well. There's actually a nice app. These are pretty similar to what you'll see in this app from Dr. Uh, Gregor. It, for those of you that like apps, it's a little checklist that you could do. So I think that's really nice. It's called Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen, for those of you that want to put that on your phone, and it's a free app. And this is basically what a whole food plant-based diet can do for you. And I, I already rattled this off on the earlier slide, so I'm not going to do that. We'll go to questions, but I'm going to just share my last slide here in case any of you, you can follow me on Instagram. When I get busy and I know I need to emphasize the need to sleep a little bit better, I usually detach from social media. So that's when you'll notice Dawn must be working on getting her six to, well, seven to nine hours of sleep. We haven't seen her post for a week. That's why. But when everything's optimized, my schedule's a little more smoother sailing, you'll see me post pretty regularly. So I try to post some recipes and different things, and I share my journey, and uh, it's kind of fun. I've, I've enjoyed Instagram because it's more for the people than some of the other um, social media channels. So I know there may be questions. I'm going to stop the share and we can open it up to questions. Uh, Don, that was absolutely fabulous. And thank you for sharing all of that. I have several questions written down, but I know other people are wanting to know as well. But you said before your heart transplant, um, you had spoken to the psychiatrist and he questioned about the personality change. Now your personality is just above and beyond. It is just incredible. Was there a change from one day to the next and what was it? So it wasn't one day to the next and truly that night that I was just so angry, that was definitely the steroids I think, but it was a good uh, kind of comparison of having that to this amazing dream. So I was happy I had that. But so this is my change and I hadn't noticed it up in it's probably about the six month mark that I noticed it. Is I'm more fun. I'm so much more fun. <laughs> but I don't do drugs, I promise. <laughs> but I love like kind of having like a thrill a little bit. So I could, that's kind of scary, right? But it's with fun things. So I love the marathon. And the next thing I want to do is I would love to do what's called Solomon running, where you can run like on the top of mountains. That looks super fun to me. Um, the Abbott Majors, I'll answer your question, Debbie, that is doing the, the major marathons across the world. So there is, I, I should know this, there's six or seven. I forget. I have it all written out how many I'm doing. So now I'm trying to do two marathons a year. So I just finished Chicago Marathon three weeks ago. I guess it was four weeks ago now. And so that was a success. So my next one, I will do the Donna Marathon again for my patients because the Donna Marathon in February, the first marathon I ran, I ran that for my patients. It's the Breast Cancer Marathon. So it's just so meaningful to me to be able to run on behalf of them and do it for those who can't. So I love it. And then a month after the Donna Marathon, well, I'm kind of in a pickle. So the month after the Donna Marathon is the Plant Strong Marathon for whole food plant-based people. So I totally want to do that. That's in Austin, Texas. And then in April, a month later, is the London Marathon, and that one's one of the Abbott Majors. So I don't know. My schedule gets pretty busy, but right now I have three marathons in the spring plan, so we'll see. Maybe some of them could be training runs, and the London will be the main one that I'm going to try to do good in. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, so awesome. that's a good question. Personality changes. I like to have fun, and I love to drive my car with the music a little bit loud. So <laughs> you see, when I turn into the hospital, I'm like, oh gosh, you got to turn that down. So it's the truth, and I just love the loud music, and so I enjoy it. I think Grace wants it. I let her have it. So that's what I do. Awesome. Well, I think Linda has a question for you next. Um, Dr. Don, one from the chat box. Lisa is interested in knowing how you start with everything. With yeah. The positive attitude, the energy to start running. How, how do you begin there? So, you know, I think when we look at those pillars of lifestyle medicine, I think what I would say is the number one question I ask my patients when I meet with them first is tell me about your sleep. And they're always kind of like, I thought we were going to talk about nutrition. I thought we were going to talk about exercise. But sleep is so important. So that's the number one thing we should look at. Are you getting seven to nine hours of sleep? If you're not, we should focus on that. The next thing I go to is diet because I honestly feel diet matters most. If we're trying to optimize our weight, whether it's lose weight or maintain our weight, the nutrition matters. The nutrition is what's going to fuel your body. We know that optimal nutrition helps the mind. 
So it's going to help that optimism. It's going to help that motivation. So I think nutrition matters so, so much. Does it need to be a whole food plant only diet? Well, if you want to feel your best, I'm going to say yes. If someone has any underlying health condition, we know that a whole food plant only diet is the only diet that has been shown to reverse heart disease, to reverse early stage prostate cancer. That is very, very important. It can reverse type two diabetes. And here's a super cool one for healthy people on this call that are kind of like, well, I probably don't need to do it. I have no health issues. Well, if you're interested in longevity medicine or anti-aging, the whole food plant-based diet is the only diet that's been shown to increase telomere length. And so telomeres are like the little caps in the ends of shoelaces and the caps are on the ends of our DNA. Those caps are called telomeres. And so the whole food plant-based diet is actually shown we've been able to lengthen that, which is equal to living longer on earth. So I am all about that, as you know. So when it comes to how to basically operationalize or how do we put that whole food plant-based diet into our daily routine, that usually is best done by meeting with a nutritionist who is very expert in this space or meeting with a lifestyle medicine doctor that's what I would recommend to start. And then from there, if folks need additional assistance, working with either support groups or health coaches to help continue that goal. When I meet with my patients, I have them do a 24 hour food journal. And then in that food journal, what I do is I usually start with breakfast. The first thing is we go over coffee. What do you put in your coffee? So coffee has a lot of medicinal properties, super cool. Coffee has been shown to reduce the risk of endometrial cancer as well as liver cancer. It may also reduce the risk of prostate cancer. Again, most women I think are on this call, but we all probably have men in our lives we care about. So coffee has shown that benefit. We also know that there seems to be a suggestion that there may be a benefit for coffee among breast cancer survivors. So coffee is healthy. We see that it's associated with living longer on earth. So thumbs up to coffee, but what you put in your coffee may be a bad thing. And so there's been research to show if you put milk, cow from an animal, uh, milk from a cow, that it will reduce the ability for you to get those benefits. But you can put soy milk in your coffee and you'll love it. Because soy milk has a little bit of fat. We know the soy is super good for you, including it's good for your breasts. And I can talk about that if someone would like to hear about that. That's, I love talking about that. In fact, I will talk about that after I answer this question fully. So put soy in your coffee and if you like cream, the soy is a great alternative because the soy has some fat. Many people haven't tried soy. Many people instead have tried almond milk and the almond milk is kind of watery and so they usually get turned off. I'm a little skeptical of the oat milk in coffee because oat milk a lot of times has oil in it and I don't want people to have added oil because it's processed. So I, by default, love the soy milk. There's calcium in soy milk. We know that the soy isoflavones itself can be very good for the breast. We also believe that the soy may be good for things like the fight against lung cancer as well as prostate cancer, no, though more research is needed. And both the American Cancer Society and the American Institute for Cancer Research have said that soy is even safe for women with breast cancer who have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So if it's safe for them, it's safe for you. And the studies are even more exciting to show when soy is consumed by breast cancer survivors after the breast cancer diagnosis, it can reduce the risk of cancer coming back and this was published in a meta-analysis by the American Cancer Society earlier this year. So I'd like to throw that out there because some people may say, I don't know if I'm going to trust her on this. I've read this the whole, my whole life that soy is bad for my breasts. That was a myth. So we can dispel that myth and know that soy is very healthy for you. The other exciting thing is within that soy option, there's edamame, there's tofu, there's tempeh. And these are great ways to replace those animal products that we don't want you to have and to get a plant protein instead. So start with the coffee. Next thing is we look at the breakfast. If they're doing eggs with cheese, I usually say, okay, well maybe we can do the egg, but let's try to get rid of the cheese. And I say, how are you cooking that egg? Are you cooking it in butter? Yes, mm, let's maybe not cook it in butter. So we analyze the eggs that they're using. I don't necessarily put a complete no to eggs, but if they're gonna do eggs, I usually want them to add something a little healthier to the egg. Like maybe we should do an omelet with some vegetables in it, no cheese, no butter. If they're doing that egg with toast, I want to know what kind of bread they're doing. When I talk to patients about doing bread, I really like the sprouted bread. You know, I am a high energy girl and I really think a lot of my energy is because of my nutrition. And I think that sprouted food really contributes to that vital energy. And so I like sprouted foods for my patients. And so sprouted bread would be a really nice thing at breakfast. 
But if someone is saying, well, Dawn, what's your favorite breakfast? Just tell me that. What if I totally change my eggs up altogether? And I would say, well, I was hoping you would ask me that. My favorite breakfast are sprouted oats with soy milk, a tablespoon of flaxseed, a tablespoon or two of sunflower seeds, and then I do some frozen fruit, depending on what you want. This morning I did frozen raspberries. Yesterday I did frozen blueberries. So I just do a frozen fruit that I add in. I do mine as overnight oats, so it's ready for me the next morning, so I don't have any preparation that morning when I'm in a hurry. So that's what I would do for breakfast. When it comes to lunch, usually most people are doing lunch on their own. So if they're doing a meat, I usually try to remove that meat with a bean product. It's typically very easy. And then dinner, depending on the family dynamic, I usually let them continue on with what they had been doing for dinner, but talk to them again about that serving size. And if they're doing meat, trying to remove that meat from whatever portion it was down to a two to four ounce serving or talking about certain recipes that we could replace the meat all together with beans um, or different tofu recipes and have some variety in the diet, which I think is really, really important. So I, I to go back in a nutshell, I do think that it can be a tad bit overwhelming perhaps for people to take this on on their own. So meeting with a health professional who's trained in this space could probably help you. If someone doesn't have access to a health professional to help them with that, I would point you in the direction of Dr. Dean Ornish. He has a wonderful book that him and his wife published called Undo It, and it maps this out very nice, and he has pretty good, he has very nice resources in the back as well that are very um, doable, feasible for anyone. It's not as strict as one would think. Okay. I don't really have a question, but I do have one thing I want to say before anybody else says it. This is one of the best chat and chew oh. we've had. Oh. I've been helping with this group for, I guess, seven or eight years now. But this uh, top, at, right at the top. So thank okay. you. I love it. Like, let me tell you something. It's just so fun for me because the more people we can get eating healthier, the less disease we're going to have in our country, the happier people are going to feel. So how does that happen? How does nutrition help us feel better? Well, for those of you that know what the gut microbiome is, that's kind of a hard word to kind of grasp. Some people know what it is, other people don't. Basically, if I kind of pivot the conversation to say, have you heard of probiotics? Everyone has heard of probiotics. People take probiotics to give their gut back those organisms, okay? So we know from research that the best way to optimize those organisms really isn't a probiotic. I'm not saying that you don't, you shouldn't do a probiotic, but the best way to optimize your gut microbiome is a whole food plant-based diet. And it's super exciting. And there's been research in the cancer space looking at the impact of cancer treatment where we look at the diversity of that gut microbiome and we see people who eat beans seem to have the most diversity. And within that gut microbiome project, they've looked at people that only have 10 different plant foods a week versus 30 different plant foods a week. And people with at least 30 different plant foods, that's actually not that hard, 30 different foods, had the best diversity of their gut microbiome. Now, if you want to get an A plus in the class and have like ooh, the holy grail of the gut microbiome, you want to get about 50 to 70. Now, that's a little hard. So we won't go there. We'll start small. But 30 is where you want to be. And that includes spices. So when I say plant foods, I mean vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, seeds, spices. So it's pretty easy to, to hit that mark. So go for the variety. And one thing I do is every time I go to the grocery store, I try to buy one to three things I haven't had the week before. Um, oh, do you have any uh, resources that you would like to share with us? Oh, yes, I can do that. I'm so happy someone said to share my screen earlier. Thank you so much. I do have several resources. And uh, let me get this down. I was copying your thing. So I think you should see that last slide there. So this movie is from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and Loma Melinda, and it goes over plant-based nutrition. It's a wonderful movie. It's one of the newer ones. It's the newest one. You know, prior to this, there was Forks Over Knives, Game Changers, Health Wise. All of those are fabulous, too. But I'm a big fan of this one. And that QR code, if you scan it, it should open right to your phone. Otherwise, you can just search Plant Wise. Another resource on that Plant Wise website is one that I love that I share with all my patients. And it's this Food is Medicine Jumpstart. So going to that website, again, is going to allow you where that Plant Wise movie is to access this free 
um, guide, you would need to put in your email and register, but there's no cost to do that. And within that guide, there's how to make a green smoothie guide, how to make a filling salad, and my favorite is, is how to make a healthy nourish bowl. So it's a wonderful free resource. And then there's even a food uh, planning opportunity that it gives you, which is individual. I think that variety is a little easier than having some dictated plan, but many patients like to have something kind of marched out, so that's in there. I also wanted to share the resource for full plate living, which is another online and group resource that many patients value and benefit, and it's a free self-guided mem membership. And again, I feel that the resources within this are very, very evidence-based. It's through the Ardmore Institute of Health, who is very active in this space. And almost lastly, my favorite cookbook is Be a Plant-Based Woman Warrior. And I know Chat and Chew More Plants is gonna have Jane and Ann Esselstein on the show in upcoming weeks, I believe. Is that correct? Yep. Yes, we're going to be doing an interview them, and that'll be up on our YouTube page. It'll Don't miss that. They're amazing. If you're on social media, follow them. They're the coolest, spunkiest women out there, and this cookbook is fabulous. I went to the gym last night. I was so tired, didn't really want to go. Worked out, felt great after. Went to the grocery store, bought my shiitake mushrooms so I could make Ann's Warrior Oats. Favorite recipe. Favorite food, someone said, what's your favorite food? What's your last meal, Don? I should ask that question. I'd say, and warrior's oats. That's what I want is my last meal. Uh, here's another great thing. This also comes from the Esselstein family. This is the Plant Strong Burger Building Guide. So don't go and buy Impossible Burger, all that processed fake meat. That's probably worse than cow's meat. It's filled with oil. Make your own bean burger, super inexpensive. It's not expensive to be on a plant-based diet when you do it like this. I do this at least once a week. I usually am in such a hurry, I don't make it as a burger. Instead, I put it in a Pyrex bowl or a Pyrex like rectangular thing. And I just cook it in my air fryer or my toaster oven. Delicious. And so there is the recipe there. And then this is from Forks Over Knives. And this is a popular one with my patients. And this is for a sheet pan dinner. And there's multiple recipes within this. I love this because, again, that batch cooking can be really convenient. And so I'll usually do two sheet pans and I'll freeze some glass bowls with these so I have it in weeks to come. But you can have it for dinner and then days later, it's really nice on a big bed of beautiful greens. And this color didn't come through as much, but that's the other really cool thing with plant-based nutrition is how beautiful the food is. And, you know, just thinking when you eat food from the earth, it's going to give you that energy. When you eat food from a factory, there's zero energy. So keep that in mind. Those are the only resources. That's it. And this picture I just thought was so precious because, again, it's kind of believing in something bigger than us. You know, that's what that's supposed to represent. So, Thank you, Dr. Don. Such an inspiring mm -hmm. message. Thank you for your honesty and vulnerability, too. And I think you touched all of our hearts. Yes, Dr. Don. Uh, it was fabulous. I think every I have had all of these personal messages of people saying how fabulous you are. You are absolutely incredible. And um, somebody said it is absolutely fabulous that you are so focused on God. So I um, and the grace has been given to you. Oh my goodness, that is so sweet. How thoughtful. Thank you so much. This has really been a pleasure. I'll tell you. Thank you for the privilege of being here and to connect with your, your audience. And this is just too generous, but so meaningful. And I will wear it. And I'm going to take a picture and I'm going to post on social media. And I think of all of you. You have just been great to work with. Thank you so much for letting me share my passion and joy with all of this. Well, thank you for being here. And, and you're we are all pumped up just be we're, we're stealing all of your energy because you have so much of it Absolutely, yeah i'm sending it to you i think we can do that you know i i had a woman i was speaking in wisconsin uh two days ago and she says well when you do this she's like don't you get depleted do you have to recharge i'm like uh -uh. I'm like, i don't want to sleep tonight usually i can't sleep usually i wake up like i woke up at four usually it's four or seven i woke up at four today so excited and then tonight i'll be all like wound up <laughs> It's great. I love it. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. The um, uh, Watch YouTube because you can replay this a dozen times. Um, you will also have all of the resources listed um, in the show notes. So um, if you did not get these um, in the meeting chat, you will certainly get them 
in the show notes. So thanks everybody. And we will see y'all next month. Okay. And thanks again, Dr. Dawn. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful apron with that just precious message. It means the world to me. Um, You can join my food for life class. And if you're not familiar with food for life, Um, Food for Life is through the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. We talk about lifestyle medicine all the time because I'm a lifestyle medicine coach. And um, my next project is the 12 Days of Christmas. This is a free program. It's going to be over three weeks. And we're going to be talking about healthy weight for the holidays, food cravings, and how food can actually boost your mood because so many people do go through a depression during the holidays. So that um, they shared the link to sign up. Um, Dr. Dawn, if you would like to share that with any of your patients, um, I would love to have them because we do have a great time on our Zoom classes. So.